<laughs> okay, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's been a little while since we've been um, online. Uh, my name is Simran and I'm with Canopy. Canopy is a co-working space that's based in San Francisco. And today we have photographer Dick Evans and journalist Kathy Chin Leong, who are the co-authors of San Francisco's Chinatown. This lovely book that's just come out. Um, it's, a it's, a photo it's a documentary photo book um, on the history and culture of San Francisco's Chinatown, uh, which is one of my favorite neighbors of San Francisco as Arrow Jackson Square location is located right next door to it. Um, Dick and Kathy, all you. Okay, thanks very much, Simran, uh, and thank you to Canopy for hosting this. Uh, and I do understand you're going to be uh, streaming over Facebook later, so if you're watching this on Facebook, we welcome you there as well. Uh, before I start the narrated slideshow, uh, I'd like to show you the book trailer, which is about a two minute video. And uh, Sophia, if you can pull up the trailer next, and just go ahead and play that when you're ready with it. Okay, well, I hope you recognized a few sites there, and I would be surprised if you did not, uh, since Canopy has two locations, uh, one, I guess, uh, Jackson Square and one uh, right on Kearney Street, that are both right on the edge of Chinatown. Um, so today we'd like to go into a little more detail of what's in the book. Uh, so Kathy and I will be handing off back and forth. In the course of producing this book, uh, I took about 5,000 photographs, which we then narrowed down to slightly over 200 in the book. And Kathy did 100 interviews, uh, which she then condensed down to some very concise and interesting uh, sidebars and stories, as well as the introductions and also the history of Chinatown. Uh, and I might mention, uh, as we go through this, uh, I suspect many of you are familiar with Zoom, so you know you probably have a, a Q&A button and a chat button on the bottom. So if a question does come up and you want to place a Q&A uh, or a question in the Q&A, or if you want to make a comment on the chat, uh, at the end, we'll come back and take a look at those two folders and try to respond to your questions and comments. So the first uh, sort of first image here of Chinatown is one that's very iconic. It's uh, Grant Avenue 
the main street that runs north south uh, through Chinatown. It's also, incidentally, the old, uh, claimed to be the oldest street in San Francisco. Uh, it had a different name previously. I think it was Dupont Avenue, uh, but it, uh, as far as a physical street, it was one of the very first, if not the first, and now it's the heart of Chinatown. So the image you see here is very typical of what we think of when we think of Chinatown, the, uh, the lanterns. Uh, you can see some of the architecture, uh, but in the next slide, you'll see a bit more of the facade of some of these buildings, the elaborate facades. Uh, and we chose this one actually to be the cover of the book, which I think you'll see next because it is so iconic. Uh, and typical of what we think of as Chinatown. In addition, uh, the pagoda roofs that you see along Grant Avenue and the uh, old street lamps, all uh, done in a, a period uh, design, are very typical of what we think of as Chinatown. But actually, the original Chinatown looked nothing like that. Uh, this is actually the railroads where you may know many of the Chinese immigrants came to work on the railroads and in the gold mines in the period of about 1850, right in the mid 1800s. And at that time, San Francisco was growing at a phenomenal rate. Uh, I believe in 19 or 1848, sorry if I said 19, 1848, the population of San Francisco was about 1,000 residents. A year later, it was 30,000 residents. And then a few years after that, it was 300,000 residents. But the uh, immigrants came from all over, but uh, a number of them came from China to work in the gold mines and then on the railroads, which you see here. And the living conditions in San Francisco were not at all what you see today. Uh, it was virtually a low cost, unsanitary ghetto, in effect, uh, that uh, uh, people were just uh, surviving uh, on a sub subsistence level. Uh, the reason why we think of Chinatown now as being this uh, elaborate uh, Oriental or Chinese architecture is that uh, in the 1906 earthquake, uh, the earthquake leveled much of that area and then the fire that came after that consumed what was in Chinatown and it was rebuilt uh, to be uh, this uh, combination, actually a tourist center and a living uh, residential neighborhood. And that was a negotiated deal between the residents of the then Chinatown and the city fathers who had a preference of actually moving uh, the Chinese immigrants out to uh, the outskirts of San Francisco. But fortunately that did not happen. Uh, now, those who came to San Francisco, uh, at least after the turn of the century and after the earthquake, they transited through Angel Island, uh, which was like the Ellis Island of the West Coast. And they were treated very much like numbers. And let me just read this because I think it's such a powerful statement. Uh, this was carved in Chinese characters on the wooden walls of the detention center on Angel Island. Everybody's got a number. I think my number is 80340. They would put your number on the blackboard and you know that you have to go to interrogation or a health checkup. They didn't use names. On the day that they let you go, your number is on the blackboard and it says San Francisco. This was uh, carved by a young man who was 11 years old at the time. So the first uh, 100 years of Chinatown were certainly dramatic from 1850 to 1950s, but that doesn't mean that history stopped then. Uh, and here's just two examples of, of notable historical significance, uh, two uh, sculptures or statues actually that are in Chinatown. This one is the goddess of democracy. And that's a replica of the much larger uh, one constructed out of wood and paper that was used by the students in Tiananmen Square. I think it was like 50 feet tall. This one is a 10 foot tall bronze 
in recognition of the students and the Tiananmen Square uprising. And another significant statue is this one in St. Mary's Square in Chinatown. Uh, by the way, that's the Bank of America building that you see behind it. Uh, but it's called the Comfort Women. And it is a tribute to the, the Chinese, uh, Filipina, and Korean girls and women who were captured and, and turned into sex slaves during World War II by the Japanese. Uh, so these two statues, I think, are much more current, uh, but speak to the struggles of, of uh, justice uh, and fair treatment. Kathy? Thank you, Dick. I first saw this mural when I was under five years old. I grew up in San Francisco in the Sunset area, and uh, we would go every weekend to buy groceries in Chinatown because that was the only place you could get Chinese groceries at the time. And I also went there when I was really little to get my shots. And this particular mural was hung in the exterior wall of the Pinyon housing building. You can imagine my shock when I saw it again more than 50 years later, hanging in the Chinese Historical Society of America Museum. It's five feet high, about 18 feet long. This is James Leong's mural covering 100 years of Chinese in America. It was criticized by the Chinese community for adding to stereotypes, even though it was historically accurate. Now, it hurt his feelings so much that he left America and spent the rest of his artistic career in Europe. Well, later on, the mural disappeared and it was recovered and found in a rec room. And parts of the seven panel mural were used as a ping pong table, if you could imagine. So now uh, the museum has it on display and it actually was able to reach James Leong in his retirement in Seattle. So he came back to retouch it and he got the honor that was due him. In front of the mural is on the left side is Sue Lee and she's an expert in Chinese American history. So what's the significance here? Next slide. Like a detective, she recovered a set of 12 extremely rare watercolors by the late Jake Lee. And here's one showing shoe factory workers in the 1800s when Chinatown was a light industrial center. Now the original one works hung in the elegant Khan's restaurant. And later after the restaurant was sold in the 1990s, the paintings mysteriously disappeared until Sue hunted them all down. Some were abandoned in a busboy's garage, others were sold at auction, and these rare works depict harsh realities as well as joyous times in early Chinese American history. I think that's a good segue into the Lunar New Year Parade. Uh, it was a picture of the parade, and of course, uh, it's the biggest cultural event in Chinatown throughout the year. Uh, takes place typically in early February. It's a destination tourism event now. Some of you may have uh, gone to it in the past. Uh, it, it appears it may not happen this year because of COVID, but uh, if it does or in the future years, if you've not been to it, it's quite a spectacle. Uh, it attracts hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, tourists and, and uh, residents of the Bay Area annually. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, lions and dragons abound in the parade, which is uh, roughly a mile long. Uh, there are also uh, floats of all types uh, by uh, commercial organizations as well as nonprofits uh, and school groups as well, including in this next picture, you see a couple young boys from West Portal Elementary School. Uh, who are dressed up in, lion, in Monkey King uh, costumes, and this young woman as well. Uh, they're all stilt walkers. You don't see the stilts here. And this is before the parade. They're getting their snacks and uh, getting ready to go on their mile-long uh, stilt walk. Uh, but uh, I was quite impressed. These are like uh, 13, 14-year-old uh, uh, young people, maybe even less than that. Uh, going a mile on these stilts. 
Of course, during uh, Lunar New Year, uh, they also celebrate the uh, whatever the symbol of the zodiac is for that year. Uh, I don't know if you can tell what this is. This is little piglets. So 2019 was a year of the pig, and hence these were being given out. They're uh, actually open up and have candy inside. Uh, there are many other colorful cultural costumes, events, uh, and traditions in Chinatown. This is a face change, uh, which is a performance in which uh, this person dances and then also uh, pulls, puts his hand over his face and pulls down different colored masks. It's quite a show. Uh, and this one is uh, actually for the Moon Festival, which happens in the fall. Uh, was just completed. Uh, this is from the 2019 Moon Festival. Uh, and the uh, woman here is Maggie Wong, who is a perennial moon goddess. She's been doing this for a number of years. Um, okay, over to you, Kathy. Well, everybody loves a festival. And up until recently, AT&T Park hosted an annual Bruce Lee tribute night festival with kung fu demos, movie clips on the big screen, and more. Now today, if Bruce Lee were alive, he would be 80 years old. Now the reason why we put him up here is because he was truly a hero for Chinese Americans. Up until then, up until the late 60s, Chinese were depicted as houseboys, um, evil emperors, or railroad workers. And if there was a lead role uh, for a Chinese person, white people would play the lead role with taped eyes and spoke English in stereotypic Chinese accents. Bruce Lee changed the life of this man on the left. This is Jeff Chin, who grew up in Chinatown. And when he moved to Daly City, he was picked on in junior high because he was Chinese and he secretly wished he was white. So one night he's looking at his Bruce Lee poster in his room after a really harrowing day of being picked on at school. And he says that he just envisioned Bruce Lee reaching out to him and talking to him and saying everything was gonna be all right. Now that gave him so much comfort. From that day on, his life changed. He took up Kung Fu. He decided to collect everything there was about Bruce Lee, original as well as um, copycat material, every bit of information. Today, he is one of the world's leading collectors of Bruce Lee memorabilia. His collections traveled around the world to museums, including the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Now we move over to Skyline Memorial Park. I call this the Ritz-Carlton of cemeteries. Every spring, Taoist priests and families come by the busload during Qingming. This is a holiday to honor dead ancestors. Dick and I came during Qingming and got a tour of the manicured premises via golf cart. Now the vistas are amazing and on the website of Skylon, you can even see aerial videos taken by drone so you can pick your plot with the best feng shui. During Qingming, families burn fake money as a symbol that relatives um, can use in the afterlife. And in contrast, in the 1800s, Chinese could not be buried with other races, and they had to go on the outskirts of the city. But today, Chinese can choose to be buried anywhere they want, and they can even design their own headstones. Uh, another Chinese tradition that you, I'm sure, have seen uh, in some of the parks in San Francisco and around Chinatown is Tai Chi, which uh, is rooted in martial arts, but today we think of more as exercise classes and, and more like a yoga class. Uh, during the photography shoots for this book, we happened to learn that there is an international Tai Chi day that is celebrated all over the world, and it was coming up in a couple of days. So uh, we worked with our partner, the Chinese Culture Center, uh, to see if we could round up some Tai Chi uh, fans and a teacher to give a free Tai Chi class. And also we offered tea and pastries uh, to get a group of people that might come and perform Tai Chi on the Kearney Street Bridge. 
with Chinatown in the background. So here they are uh, uh, on it, uh, Tai Chi Day. Uh, also during the photo shoot, uh, not this particular one, but a different time, uh, we happened to find uh, this woman who is actually the wife of an herbalist. And we were there to photograph the herbalist because we wanted his shop and him with some of his herbs and so on. And when we were there, we saw these huge trophies up on top of the cabinets. Uh, so we asked where those came from and uh, he and his wife consulted in Chinese and then came back and said, oh, those belong to my wife. Uh, she is a Tai Chi master. Uh, so we said, oh, that's terrific. Uh, do you, which, uh, would you be willing, speaking to her, would you be willing to come back when we have more time uh, and go around Chinatown and give us some Tai Chi poses in front of murals or iconic buildings or other uh, iconic backgrounds? Uh, so sure enough, she showed up on the day of a appointment with this spectacular pink uh, silk outfit. As you can see, uh, she's no question a Tai Chi master or a Sifu as they call it. Uh, her name was Xu Fen Zhao uh, and was really great about uh, giving us dozens of different poses uh, in front of different uh, landmark uh, areas. Uh, here are two women who participated in that uh, International Tai Chi Day. Uh, they said they had a great time, were more than happy uh, to pose uh, for a picture after the Tai Chi class. Now, another tradition is the red egg in Jinju Party, the baby's coming out party at one month old. So we were lucky to find one because they're rapidly diminishing. A lot of families are choosing just to have it at home or to have it in the South Bay at one of the Chinese restaurants that are at many of the Chinese shopping centers. But here you see Ron Tong on the left, and he's the proud grandfather of Baby Rose in the center. Now, at every baby party, you have dyed red eggs to represent fertility and good fortune, and a plate of ginger, which represents energy and strength. I think it's the kids that love Chinese New Year the most. Um, here is my nephew, Tyler Pham, and he was happily uh, willing to pose for us when we told him he would be receiving real money inside these Chinese envelopes. So you typically give two envelopes and you give two bills in each one to represent double happiness. And just so you're prepared, the next zodiac year is Year of the Ox that begins on February 12th. So get those fresh bills at the bank before they run out. Now when a girl um, grows up and gets engaged, typically the bride-to-be will order a custom tailored cheng song to order for the wedding. Now speaking from experience, these are really form-fitting and very tight. At my Chinese wedding with 600 people, I changed my white wedding dress into my cheng sam, and we toasted all 60 tables so I didn't have to sit down and avoided getting embarrassed. Now today, times have changed. You don't have to get a tailored cheng sam. You can buy one off the rack, get a different type of Chinese dress, or order one on the internet. Meanwhile, the wedding tea ceremony is a treasured tradition as well, but fewer and fewer couples, I'm sad to say, are doing it. However, Leanna and Michael are the exception. On their knees, they will present their tea to the elders. The parents and grandparents, one couple at a time, receive the tea, and then they offer the bride and groom money and jewelry and a blessing. Now brides aren't the only ones that receive jewelry. Many times a woman will start handing down her heirlooms to her granddaughter, daughter, daughter-in-law or son even when she feels the time is right. In ancient times, if you wore a 24 karat gold necklace or jade bracelet, it was believed that you would be protected from evil spirits. So this is what makes Chinese jewelry so unique because it's not only ornamental. It, many people believed it possesses powers and is also being used as money during times of war. We really wanted to get a photo of this woman. This is Lisa Pollard and she is the band director for the Green Street Mortuary Band. 
She knows Chinatown inside and out, and she's been walking these streets more than a decade. The Green Street Mortuary Band helps Chinese families say farewell to loved ones. Now the music is of the highest caliber because the musicians are professionals. They play in the San Francisco Symphony and the San Francisco Opera. And several years ago, author Amy Tan hired the band to lead her mother's funeral procession through Chinatown. Now this is one of my most favorite murals, which unfortunately is not up anymore. It's been painted over. You see a modern woman passing a traditional tailor shop selling Cheng Songs. And on her wrist, if you look carefully, is a traditional jade bracelet, probably from her mother or grandmother. She's carrying a bag of good luck oranges and a box of bakery treats for sweet life. And these are expected gifts when visiting a Chinese friend or relative. This is my family sharing dim sum, otherwise known as going to yum cha. And it's a very common memory for American born Chinese. Little plates of chicken feet and steamed tripe and gizzards are not exotic, they're everyday dishes. So what's your dim sum people we would like to hear? Use the chat feature and tell us. Okay, thank you, Kathy. I was just gonna remind people as well, add uh, any questions or comments in the chat uh, folder as we go along here. Um, so in Chinatown, there are a lot of nonprofit organizations. In fact, I think there are more nonprofits per capita than any other neighborhood in San Francisco, and perhaps by quite a wide margin. Uh, but that reflects the very strong sense of community. This is a picture of the entrance to the Chinese Culture Center, which is on Kearney Street. It's actually in the uh, Hilton Hotel on the third floor uh, there. Uh, so this sense of community is felt very strongly if you take a stroll through Portsmouth Square, which is in the next uh, image here. Uh, and you'll typically see uh, women and men playing cards, playing mahjong, just talking out in the square. Um, and I happened to be there uh, on a day when it was sunny. I was taking some pictures and all of a sudden the rain cloud came over, it just poured down rain. And I assumed, well, the card games are over, might as well pack up and head to my car and head home. Uh, but I noticed the women playing cards never put down their hand. Uh, they never, they just held onto their cards. They pulled out their umbrellas. They moved over under the overhang of the bridge a bit and the card game continued. Uh, so this is just a very typical scene of what you see in Portsmouth Square. Or if you were nearby in one of the benevolent associations or the family benevolent associations, uh, on a Saturday morning, you might see a scene like this uh, where men and women uh, are gathering together uh, to play uh, mahjong and to play uh, cards. So a very strong sense of community. Um, it's also reflected in the fact that there is a Miss Chinatown uh, USA, actually. So it's not just San Francisco, but there is a, a pageant to select a Miss Chinatown uh, for the US. It's held in San Francisco. Uh, about half of the contestants are from San Francisco. Uh, and this one who was the winner in 2019 happens to be from San Francisco. Uh, this is Catherine Wu. And it's not just a beauty contest. It's a contest of, uh, of talent on community commitment here. She's involved uh, working with a bilingual school. And then uh, here we see, to our surprise, we found out she's also an Olympic level archer. So an Olympic level athlete in archery. Uh, so we talked her into having her very uh, fancy, expensive bow and arrows and uh, uh, we went around a couple different locations uh, in San Francisco to get some shots of her uh, with her bow and arrow. Uh, now, a similar, uh, well, I, sh I should say the reason why there's a Miss Chinatown USA uh, is important, and that is that historically, Chinese young women and girls were not allowed to compete in the uh, regular 
Miss America or Miss California pageants, uh, both uh, overtly and uh, secretly discriminated against and prohibited. So that's why they formed their own uh, Miss Chinatown pageant. Now that's long since changed, of course, but it's also the reason why you have your own uh, YMCA in Chinatown, which you see here, uh, because the Chinese in Chinatown were strongly discouraged, if not prohibited, from using other Ys around the city. Uh, so they got together and were able to uh, form their own Y, which even to today is uh, very actively used by the citizens, residents of Chinatown. Uh, the same is also true about the reason that there is a Chinese hospital in the next slide. Um, and this is actually the donor wall. Uh, it's a brand new hospital, just a few years old. Uh, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, and it was originally there uh, because, again, discrimination against the Chinese in terms of use of uh, hospitals elsewhere. And in this particular case, um, I think Kathy may have mentioned or not that Bruce Lee was born in this hospital. And I think you were born here, right, Kathy? Yeah, I was. Yeah. I'm not saying what year, though. <laughs> Before it was remodeled, though, I think. Yeah, a couple of years. No, I'm so glad there are places like YMCA and the Chinatown Hospital to provide safe harbor for kids and also good health care for adults. Um, Chinatown's the densest neighborhood outside of Manhattan. It's only one fifth of a square mile and houses anywhere between 15,000 to 30,000 people. How is that possible? Well, imagine your home is the size of a closet. Imagine that closet shared with four or more people. So welcome to single renter occupancy or SRO apartment living. So here with no access to washers or dryers, you have to hand wash and you have to hang your clothes outside to dry. You have no place for the kids to play or do homework and you have to line up to share kitchens and restrooms with neighbors. One of Chinatown's heroes is Reverend Norman Fong on the left. And when he came to give us a tour of the SROs, we were surprised that a, a young woman came up and asked him if he would go and visit her grandmother on the upper floor. The grandmother was sick and she did not have the strength to go walk down the stairs because there's no elevators in these places. Um, she was ill, she couldn't get to go to the doctor, but all the girl wanted was him to come and visit and pray for her. So we were very privileged to be able to follow him upstairs and to see the little sweet interaction they had together as he whispered a prayer in Chinese. Now to be young again and to have the balance. It was cold and rainy on the day of our photo shoot and we sat with the kids inside the boat as it rocked. And my notebook was getting saturated with raindrops and Dick almost lost his camera. So if you're on the Dragon Boat Racing Team for the Community Youth Center, all your gear and practice time is free of charge. And unlike other groups that require tryouts, CYC accepts everyone who wants to be on the team. And in this case, it's junior high and high schoolers. CYC's Dragon Boat Sport is transforming the lives of at-risk kids who might be tempted to join the wrong crowd. So it was great to see the older kids treat the younger ones like siblings. Bella Chen admits she was completely unathletic before joining the team, but now she's the team captain. And she says that racing has helped produce leadership skills in her and boosted her confidence. Now in my youth, I have to admit, I was really ashamed and I did not have anything to do with Chinese ways or Chinese culture. But today things are different. Many kids are being pr are very proud of being Chinese. And here you see Yu Han Chen. At that time, the picture was taken. She was only six years old and she was picking up the brush for the first time at this Chinese New Year event. And she finds out that she's really good at Chinese calligraphy. My nephew, Tyler Pham, again, happily samples dragon beard candy, making a dragon beard of his own. Now this was the dessert of ancient Chinese emperors 
that was made from a solid block of syrup and hand pulled out like taffy to form thousands of strands. And the dragon beer dipped in peanut bits is especially delicious. Now during this photo shoot, L. Young, um, all of seven, I believe, posed for us all over Chinatown in her very cool purple rain boots as she played with her umbrella. But after an hour, she got really tired and she wanted to find her mom and she started running away from us. So have you ever tried to chase down a seven year old on a crowded wet street of Chinatown? It's not an easy thing to do. But we finally caught up with her at her mom's restaurant, Dim Sum Corner, and she was sitting happily on a bar stool. Now I want to tell you that these buildings are not just ornamental. They belong to family associations and there's more than 200 of them in Chinatown. Back in the 1800s, if you landed in Chinatown as an immigrant, you would look up your association that was based on village or last name. The association would help you secure a job and a place to stay. Many of these associations feature shrines. And I just want you to know that these are private clubhouses used for Mahjong and their meetings. So it's not open to tourists or outsiders. In fact, we were able to get in only because of a connection, um, a member who, is, who had to ask his elders for permission for us to go. So getting these pictures is extremely rare. A play called King of the Yees came to San Francisco last year, written by Lauren Yee. And she grew up in Chinatown and she spent many years attending Yi Family Association luncheons and festivities. The largest of these is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, also known as the CCBA. And it consists of 50,000 members in the US and Canada. And these leaders pictured here all rotate being president for one month at a time. Now recently they worked with officials to block marijuana shops from coming into Chinatown. Now the largest problem facing the associations is future leadership because they're headed by elderly men and most sons are not involved and women are not encouraged. Great grandmother Cecilia Chain is famous. She's internationally known um, as the Julia child of Chinese cooking. One of her signature dishes was called the beggar's chicken, an entire chicken baked in a large clay ball and broken at the table of the diner, causing applause every time this was done. I wonder if any of you out there has had beggar's chicken. Back in 1968, she opened the very first elegant Chinese restaurant called the Mandarin, based in Ghirardelli Square. Her son Philip caught the restaurant bug and he is the co-founder of P.F. Chains with restaurants all over the world. Have any of you ever eaten at P.F. Chains? Chinese school began early in Chinatown because parents feared their children would lose language and culture. So it started as early as the late 1800s. And in the um, 1950s and 60s, if you disobeyed, you would get wrapped on the knuckles with a ruler or get spanked by principal. In Chinese school, kids learned Cantonese because most immigrants came from Guangdong province. And now kids are learning Mandarin, the national language of China. Music and dance is also important to Chinese culture, of course, uh, in, in all forms from formal Chinese opera to Forbidden City Follies to uh, very energetic lion dancers play an important role in Chinatown's identity. Uh, this is a young man setting up a backdrop for the Chinese opera. Uh, I was lucky to get invited backstage uh, to be present during a three and a half hour uh, makeup uh, session getting ready for the opera. It really takes that long. It's really <laughs> quite an experience. Uh, so I was able to uh, take photos. They were very generous with their time and availability all the way through the process. Uh, here you see nearly being complete. And once you've gone through that three and a half hours of makeup, uh, it does make the final scene a little more dramatic to you. You certainly appreciate it more. And by the way, I did ask, uh, how long does it take to take the makeup off 
if it took three or three and a half hours to put it on. The answer was about 15 minutes. So <laughs> they're anxious to get it off when the play is over. Uh, another dressing room that I was able to go into was the Grant Avenue Follies. Uh, Grant Avenue Follies uh, is a very interesting group founded by Cynthia Yee. It's a group of women who were burlesque dancers in the uh, golden era uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in Chinatown. Uh, so now mostly in their, their 70s, a few even in their 80s, uh, they form together to form the Grand Avenue Follies, and they still perform with elaborate costumes. Uh, they do a, a terrific job, very entertaining. They do a number of benefit uh, programs like for veterans and other uh, nonprofit groups. And they're, uh, I think, a real testament to uh, the health benefits of continuing dance throughout your lifetime. Now, lion dancing looks easy, but it's not. It's filled with dangerous acrobatics requiring handstands and flips. Moving a 10 pound lion head to mimic a real lion seems fun, but if you haven't practiced, your arms will fail you and you won't even last through an entire parade. This is Corey Chan and we call him the lion head whisperer. For over 40 years, he's been restoring injured lion heads and gives them back their roar. He's simply self-taught. He replaces broken eyelid strings used for blinking. He glues on new fur. He paints over scratches until the lion looks like new. And after repairs, Corey says, new memories come back to the lion. So aren't these stunning? Those photos, by the way, were in Corey's garage, which has no cars in it, just lion heads. <laughs> and he must have 20, 25 of these that he's repaired. They're spectacular. To many uh, visitors and residents as well, I think a Chinatown experience is simply not complete uh, without a stop at a restaurant or uh, a bakery or a dim sum uh, uh, takeout place. And I know the three years that I was taking photos in Chinatown, I would very seldom get out of the neighborhood without a dim sum or a bakery stop along the way. Uh, there is a even a best-selling book uh, titled The Woman Who Ate Chinatown, the San Francisco Odyssey, which was written by the late uh, Shirley Fong Torres. Now, many people have their favorite local restaurant like this one, which is uh, definitely a local uh, type restaurant. And often you see roasted ducks in the window like you see here. Uh, now, roasted ducks are never gonna disappear even as restaurants change. But the newer restaurants are creating a much more open, light, lighter dining environment. This happens to be at China Live. And the lower uh, shot there is not a picture on the wall or something. That's looking straight through into the kitchen. And the kitchen looks something like this. Uh, you know, very light, very open. Uh, just uh, uh, here is George Chen, who is the founder of China Live and the uh, chef. Here's some giant steamers. And then there's my favorite too, the giant chocolate mousse bowl mixer. Uh, China Live uh, also has a special dining area upstairs called Eight Tables. And it literally is eight tables, each in a separate uh, partitioned room. Uh, and you can see one of the rooms here. Uh, and it is uh, uh, as contrasted to the very open uh, casual downstairs large restaurant. This one is for uh, private parties, uh, special events. Uh, they do do some uh, some banquet events as well. Uh, but here you can get a prefix meal for roughly three hundred dollars with drinks. And I'm I'm looking forward to doing that when uh, things uh, open back up. Um, this is another uh, upscale. Uh, new restaurant in Chinatown called Mr. Jews. And I might mention it's in the building that you saw in the cover of the book, uh, which used to house a very famous restaurant called the Four Seas Restaurant. 
the sign is still outside for four C's, but a restaurant inside is a Michelin starred Mr. Jews. Here you see, I think, one of their very precise dishes that they serve. There are also many more uh, uh, younger, more casual uh, restaurants. Uh, this is one of the emerging stars uh, for young chefs, uh, Kathy Fang and her restaurant, Fang's. Well, this happy employee works at Mo Li Xin Ki, a business of dried meats and poultry. It's one of the oldest businesses in Chinatown, over 100 years old, spanning seven generations. Yum. Raise your hand if you ever had dried salted fish, otherwise known as ham yu. I love it, steamed over rice in a rice cooker. This is a precious food memory for me. When I stayed at my grandmother's studio apartment when I was a little kid, Papa prepared this for breakfast. Do you have Chinese food memories? Share with us in the chat box. Coffee crunch cake, anyone? Eastern Bakery is only one of two bakeries making the famous confection in San Francisco. The other is in Japantown. Now I've tried making this from scratch and it's an all day affair. So sometimes it's easier just to buy it. This is Stockton Street, known as the locals Chinatown. And every day at four o'clock, the little grandmas emerge from their SRO apartments. They come out in swarms for produce bargains. You'll hear the phrase, yep man, yep bao. The vendors are saying one dollar, one bag. And there's one thing that unites us Chinese through all the centuries, no matter what the generation, no matter what village, we all love a good sale. And what are all these unattractive dried roots and berries? These are ingredients in a healthy family soup recipe, which is usually handed down from generation to the next. Now you take a fistful of this, handful of that, and you'll have a concoction that'll clear up your acne, strengthen your chi, or help you recover from childbirth. So a traditional Chinese mother cooks soup daily for her family, but in that respect, I am not a traditional Chinese mother. In addition to the restaurants and the food markets, uh, there are a number of other small entrepreneurial businesses in uh, Chinatown, of course. And no one is more entrepreneurial, harder working, and determined than Tane Chen here, uh, known as the walk lady uh, with her shop, The Walk Shop. Uh, 82 years old, and when I spoke with her a couple months ago, she's going in six or seven days a week to handle her online orders and keep the business running and keep the lights on. Uh, there are many different businesses. I mentioned earlier the, the woman in pink that was the Tai Chi master. This is her husband who has this herbalist uh, shop. Uh, here's a florist uh, on, in Was Alley, uh, dress designer studio photographer, and an acupuncturist. And of course, many, there are many others. But if you think about it, Chinatown has everything that a community needs to be self-sufficient. Because again, if you go back in history, Chinatown had to be self-sufficient because it did not have access to some of the other services uh, and uh, shops and the nonprofits around the city. Some businesses cater particularly to the uh, tourism sector, like this one, the kite shop, uh, which is always a great hit with kids. Uh, gourmet tea tasting rooms where you can really get a lesson in uh, tea selection and, and how best to serve tea and prepare it. Traditional jade carvings, uh, boutiques. And also similar to the restaurants, you're starting to see an emergence of some new upscale uh, shops, uh, boutiques for uh, cooking items, uh, art, and clothing. This one actually being the gift shop at China Live and uh, completely sourced by uh, Cindy Chen, uh, who is, uh, her husband is the chef. Uh, and she put together the whole retail space uh, of the gift shop by traveling to China and elsewhere in the world and sourcing 
some of the best quality, best design uh, items that she can find all around the world. So it's really a wonderful uh, gift shop. And here you see another one. Uh, this is a clothing boutique, boutique uh, called Kim Plus Ono. It's a takeoff on the word kimono. Uh, and here you see, uh, again, this they hosted a uh, uh, Crazy Rich Asians Lookalike Contest last year at the Moon Festival. And here was one of the people that came in to participate in her outfit. And finally, I'll end with this image. Uh, this is an image from a back hallway of the restaurant Dim Sum Corner, which is one of the new restaurants, uh, specializing, as you would guess from the name, in Dim Sum. It's on the corner of Grant Avenue and I believe it's California Street. Um, and uh, I recommend it. Excellent food if you want to get a, a quick, a very fresh meal of dim sum. But we saw this mural in the back hall and it was just such a uh, interesting uh, combination. So you look at this woman and here you've got a, a very uh, sort of graphic art vibe to this, uh, but she's in a traditional red dress. Uh, you've got a modern camera and you've got this confident contemporary young woman uh, behind the camera. Uh, so we thought that was a perfect representation of Chinatown for the future. Uh, confident, contemporary, and looking ahead. And that's why we chose it for the back cover uh, of the book. So here you see some ways to contact us. Uh, there's an extensive website. Uh, about the book, which has many more photos than in the book, actually, and also many more of Kathy's interviews and stories. Uh, also, it has a way that you can uh, connect to order the book. Uh, I should mention here that the book was a nonprofit project in the sense that all the benefits, all the revenue from the book sales uh, is going to the Chinese Culture Center, which is doing a lot of good activities uh, in the community in Chinatown and then to the nonprofit publisher, Heyday Books of Berkeley, uh, who are a champion of publishing uh, books on California history, indigenous people and social justice issues. So I saw Kathy, there were a couple questions in the chat room and um, I can certainly take the one about what camera and lens did you use? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I used a, a Sony A7 system, which is a, you know, a modern uh, uh, digital mirrorless uh, camera with exchangeable lenses. Uh, it is, uh, and there uh, is it what they call an R3 and an R4, uh, just two generations. So I have one body that's an R3 and one that's an R4. In terms of the lenses, uh, I would say 70% of the photos that you saw here and in the book were taken with an f 2.8 24 by 70 zoom lens. So from a, a pretty good wide angle to a very short telephoto, but uh, you know, very good for portraits, for street scenes. Uh, um, so that was most of the most frequently used. I also inside for some of the indoor shots, I used a super wide angle and even a fisheye lens for a few shots uh, where you're like inside a store and you want to be able to show a, like a 270 degree, degree uh, uh, view. Uh, and then there were a few where I used uh, telephoto like uh, uh, 70 to 200 uh, uh, zoom. Um, I might say the 24 by 70 is, uh, is a very nice high speed Zeiss zoom lens and uh, you know the advantage that you have with a high speed lens they cost more of course but <laughs> the advantage is that you can shoot in lower light conditions uh, and particularly where you're shooting inside as well as outside and in shadows and sometimes at dusk uh, having that extra capability with the uh, higher speed lens that collects more light is a, is a huge advantage. Great. There's a question here about um, where we had dim sum, and we had dim sum at that time in the photo at uh, New Asia, 
And it's one of many places in Chinatown where you can have dim sum. There's City View, Bugoni, and Dim Sum Place. So very, a lot of them. I encourage people to go back into Chinatown and support the community. And Dick, there's a question on whether or not you're doing an exhibit of your work yeah. in the future. Yeah. Uh, well, initially, we, we planned to do a, an exhibit when we did the launch. Uh, we had planned to uh, produce some uh, enlargements that would be, you know, like 24 by 36 or even uh, 36 by 54. Uh, and to have them on exhibit when we did the launch there and then, then perhaps loan them out to other exhibits. Uh, unfortunately, with the inability to hold uh, live events, uh, we we scrapped that at, at the point that we went to planning for all these virtual events. Uh, of course, we have all of the, the picture files, so it would not be a huge challenge to do that if we reach a point where uh, we could do a, a live exhibit where people could really appreciate it. Uh, this is the third uh, book that I've done on neighborhoods, as I, I think maybe uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, the one that I did on the mission, we did an exhibit at the launch. So we had about 30 pictures and people really enjoyed that because as you can imagine, uh, the people in these pictures are, are known by many people in Chinatown. Uh, so they love to uh, bring their families, bring their friends. Uh, and uh, particularly if you can see a life life, uh, life size photo of yourself in a nice exhibit, it's really, uh, really pleasant. So maybe if things are under control uh, sometime in the spring or after Lunar New Year, we'll be able to do an exhibit somewhere in Chinatown. Yeah, I really hope that happens because I mean, I this is such a such a great uh, presentation you guys did and so insightful. And as I mentioned before, um, the County Jackson Square location is literally next door to Chinatown. So I've, I've been lucky enough to like, you know, get out on like a few walks and meander through Chinatown and learn more about it because there's just so much history. And it's also it's a gorgeous book. Um, and as Dick was saying, said like, go ahead and um, Go visit ChinatownBookSF.com. It's written on the screen and where you can learn more about the book and buy it, give it as a gift for people because it's it's gorgeous. I'm, I'm holding it right now. It's, uh, it's also on Amazon, of course, Barnes and Noble and so on, but you can pick it up uh, in person at some of the local independent bookstores in San Francisco, as well as at the Chinese Culture Center. Uh, and I actually think... Uh, Tane Chen wants to carry the book at the walk shop. So if you want to pick up a walk and a book, <laughs> you can go there. There's actually another question. Um, are people able to get signed copies of the book? Oh, uh, good question. The answer is yes. Uh, there's only two locations though that you can get signed copies. One is the Chinese Culture Center. And the second one is the Booksmith in Haight-Ashbury. Uh, and the reason it is that we, uh, we got several hundred complimentary books as part of our arrangement with the publisher. Uh, and we gifted those to those two organizations. And then Kathy and I went there and signed all of these books so they could sell them and gain the full profit from having these complimentary books to resell uh, and to be able to sell signed copies. Uh, so I would refer you uh, to Chinese Culture Center or the booksmith.com. Again, thank you so much, and thank you, Andrea, for bringing putting this together with us. Um, any last things to say? Go to no. Chinatown. Yeah, go. <laughs> go to Chinatown. Exactly. Have you have you both been to Chinatown in the last month or so? Yes. Yes. How, how has it been? Well, it suffered greatly because of the COVID. Um, there were a number of small businesses that did not have the ability to do business online. Uh, you know, so they've really been hit. Uh, also, even before the COVID crisis became full blown and the lockdown started, uh, people were reluctant to go to Chinatown thinking they would catch coronavirus. And the irony is Chinatown has been about the lowest incident neighborhood in all of San Francisco. <laughs> despite the fact that it had these this very dense housing, you know, all the ingredients to have a real problem. 
But people there were careful, they wore masks, they distanced, they stayed inside from the very beginning. Uh, so here you, here you actually have uh, uh, quite a safe neighborhood. They've now started to open up uh, the restaurants and, and like around many parts of the city, you find these uh, uh, outdoor seating areas on Grand Avenue. They close part of the street uh, during weekends. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, it is opening up now. And most businesses, uh, you can go inside and shop now or even eat. Uh, uh, but uh, they need your business because it has been really rough. And I think somebody commented here uh, that you can order and get it uh, shipped to you. And, and yes, absolutely, um, you can do that. So uh, please support your favorite uh, restaurant. Yes, please, please go to Chinatown, walk around, look at the murals, support, support everyone that's over there. Okay, well, we're out of time. And again, thank you so much, Kathy and Dick. Um, and saying again, I have the book in front of me and I love it. Uh, so I'm going to spend some time later this evening actually like, reading more into it. Um, so yeah, um, this is posted, paste, it's posted up on uh, YouTube. It'll be up on YouTube tomorrow and this is live on Facebook. So if anyone has any comments on there, please send them over and I can send, send any questions back over to Kathy and Dick for, you, for them to answer. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.